if this is an interview at the Embassy Suites, Syracuse, New York. It is the 5th of June, 2007, approximately 9.15 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, my name is Milton Van Epps. I was born in uh, Perryville, New York, December 7, 1925. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering the surface? I graduated from Casanova High School. Okay. Um, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was sliding downhill uh, with a group of kids, and someone heard it on the radio. Um, of course, it was on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. It was on your birthday. Yeah, my 16th birthday. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you had a particular reaction to Pearl Harbor. Why was that? Uh, my cousin, Vern Austin, was on the ship. He was killed. I knew he was on the ship, but it was quite some time before we learned that he had been killed. Mm -hmm. What ship was he on? Arizona. Mm -hmm. Now you have a photograph of him if you want to just yeah. show that, hold that up. He was uh, I'm a getting boy. a little bit of glare. That's good to hold it just like, just like that. He was a few months older than I was. He quit school. And okay. His father, uh, you can put it down now. Father signed the paper so he'd get the Navy. Of course, it was peacetime. Huh? Uh, now, you were very close, you you said. Yes, we were like brothers. My grandmother was one of us, but both of us were neighbors. Uh, he was one grade ahead of me in school. Mm -hmm. Now, you enlisted? Later on in the Navy? I graduated June 21st and I enlisted the 7th of July. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick the Navy? Well, my father had been in World War I and my uncle uh, was in World War I. And Laverne, uh, my cousin, was in the Navy. It's, I never considered anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where did you go for your basic training? Samson Naval Training Station. Mm -hmm. Now, what was Samson like at that time? It was about half done, half constructed. Uh, we worked some wheel and racks in a little while, but uh, uh, it was bitterly hot that summer. We got all our shots and uh, run the obstacle course and so forth. It was a long, hot summer. How long were you at Samson? I think it was 13 weeks. Mm -hmm. Now, have you gone back to visit Samson since then at all? Yes, I went back a couple of years ago. They have a museum there. Souvenirs and so forth. Everything else is gone. Mm -hmm. From there, I went to Newport, uh, Rhode Island, Gunners Mate School. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? Uh, I got out of there in late November of that year. I don't remember how many weeks we were there. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, after you left the Newport, where did you go? I was assigned to the California battleship, which was in Dry Dock in uh, Bremerton, Washington. They had uh, towed it up there from Pearl Harbor and rebuilt it. And I lived on shore for about a month and worked on the ship while I was in Dry Dock. Mm -hmm. So what kind of work did you do on the ship? Uh, getting the guns ready, uh, loading the ammo, have everything ready to put to sea. Mm -hmm. 
I spent Christmas in Bremerton. Then we went to San Diego and back on short break in. Then we went to Pearl Harbor and from there we went to war. Mm -hmm. Now, being a gunner's uh, gunner on the ship, what what kind of gun were you assigned to? I had a 40 millimeter quad mount in the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Now, when you uh, worked with that gun, d did you uh, do one position, or did you have several duties, or? or no, being a gunner's uh, mate, I had. It was my duty to keep the gun uh, functioning. Mm -hmm. If I couldn't, if I wasn't capable, I had to call on her uh, until we started in action. The word not really that much to do, just make sure everything was clean. How often did you have to clean those? Uh, well, if we didn't fire them and we kept them on the cover so they wouldn't get salt water on them, mm -hmm. we didn't have to clean them that much. Now, what kind of cleaning equipment did you have? Did you have like a huge uh, yeah. pole with a brush on it to, right. to run down the, the bore? Had some kind of a solid to use uh, after we fired them. Mm -hmm. well, after we got into battle, uh, of course we couldn't use any lights on the ship, so at night we would cover the gun with a tent. And we could have lights inside the tent. And we would strip all four guns, clean everything. Put it all mm -hmm. back together. Did they require quite a quite a lot of oil to keep them lubed? Yeah, um, they weren't blue. Most of them were uh, camouflage mm -hmm. blue uh, paint. But we could spend all day firing other guns in battle and spend all night taking them apart and putting them together. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've done a lot of firing. Did they have a tendency to foul or jam or anything? Not really. Uh, one big problem we had was the fire cases. When everything worked right, they went to the chute in the bottom of the, the, the mound. And they would put over the side. But that chute would get plugged up. <laughs> and when you're getting shot at, you don't have, don't have to get down in there and unplug it. So the whole mount would get littered with fire cases, and that was bad. Were those cases pretty hot once they, they, were they hot, fired? Very, very, very hot. Uh -huh. How did you clear them out? Did you ever clear them out during the, while you were firing, or did you have to wait until? We had to wait. We mm -hmm. could throw them over the side. It was uh, 20 or 30 feet. We were on like a second deck and down below us was a 5 inch 38 anti aircraft gun that we had to throw over. Mm -hmm. But we didn't get much sleep on the orders on. What actions were you involved in? We were in seven invasion. And we talked away from Guam, Saipan, Tinian, Lady. Were you ever under attack by kamikazes? Yeah. The first three missed us. We either blew them up before they got to us or they missed the ship. The fourth one, off of Luzine, uh, I can't think of the name of the Anyways, he hit us right dead center. Killed 53 men outright and wounded 238, which some later died. Uh, was he carrying a torpedo or a bomb when he yeah, hit? Bomb. It was a Val Japanese bomber, and they had.
had stationary landing gear in that particular plane. Mm -hmm. The bottom was strapped between the truck and the landing gear. Uh, he went to my left about 50, 60 feet behind the bulkhead. So some of uh, my men got some shrapnel. Being a gun captain, I wore headphones that was connected to the gunnery officer on the bridge. And when he saw that the plane wasn't going to miss us, he passed word over the headphones to the port side seat cover. Having the headphones on, I was the first one in the gun mount to get the message. I screamed out the seat cover and dove down in the gun tub and all those guys on top of me. I didn't get anything, any injuries. A real good friend of mine from Chicago was killed, uh, Joe Harkey. Two nights later we had a burial at sea. It was about midnight and pitch dark. And we slid the bodies over the side on a seat of plywood in a body bag. Mm -hmm. And each bag had a five inch anti aircraft shell on it for the weight. As we slid them over the side, the chaplain gave his service uh, from memory. He couldn't read anything because it was dark. Mm -hmm. Also, during the night, uh, on board the ship, they had pre painted plywood that matched the paint on the ship. In the pitch dark, they covered all the damage and uh, painted some of it. And by daylight next morning, a submarine, a couple hundred yards away, couldn't tell that we had been hit. We lost a lot of our hydraulics and power. Did you have to head back someplace for repair after that? No. Uh, during the night, I think it was the third night, we tied up to a hospital ship. That's quite a feat, out in the the ocean, in the dark. And we transferred the really severely wounded men to the hospital ship. And I think from there we went to Guam and then Pearl Harbor for repair. Mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor, I got off the ship, I got a naval appointment to the academy, and they sent me back to the States. I got back to the States in uh, April, and the graduation for the prep class that I would join was in May. <laughs> so I, I was too late. I resigned the appointment that I had. And they, told me that I made a bad mistake. Well, I was assigned to a picket ship destroyer, the Mile C-5. That was being built in Boston, and when I got aboard it, we went out and checked down to Guantanamo Bay and back. Most of the crew consisted of uh, prisoners that had gotten licensed prison for desertion and so forth. And the Navy gave them the choice of serving out the war on that destroyer or and getting a dishonorable discharge. Or they could stay in jail and serve their term. So it was an awful crew. My job was to teach them how to run the 40 millimeter aircraft. They weren't deep in it. All they wanted to do was goof off. So we went through the canal to Pearl Harbor. We left there for the invasion of Japan. And my Earl, uh, Truman, President Truman, let him drop the bomb on Japan. And I'm certain it saved my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I had already seen what those Japanese are capable of. It would have been 
thousands of people. You know. What was it like aboard ship? Was it a pan pandemonium and ce celebration at that point? Uh, mm. Yeah, we kept right on going. We were there for the surrender. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But did you did you witness any of the celebrate or uh, the uh, surrender? Yeah. Well, uh, I wasn't aboard the Missouri. We were next to him. We mm -hmm. were right anti aircraft car. But every ship in the harbor, uh, their guns were loaded and pointed skyward up the sky. Mm -hmm. Thousands of American planes come in and they circle in. Uh, I got some pictures from a Marine that was on the Missouri. I didn't bring them with me. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit. You were in the uh, ba naval battle in the Atlantic Gulf? Yeah. Uh, we were also in the Civil Sea in Cigar Hill Strait. Uh, that was during the night. Japanese fleet had to come through the straits. It was a, like a large river. And they had to come through single file. They couldn't spread out. And we were out in the Sulu Sea uh, at 90 degrees of them in front of them, what the admirals call crossing the T. And as they came out of the strait, we could pick them up on radar, and uh, they were at our mercy. They had burning ships all around us. At that time, we didn't know how many had got away. Some of them had turned around and went back. Oh, the following morning, the, the water was just covered with Japanese sailors, sharks. Yeah, it was awful lot. And as I said, the captain didn't know how many the Japanese ships that got away, so he was looking for a counterattack. He let us put the lifeboats over the side and gave us one hour to pick up a Japanese who would surrender. And we never got one. We had a couple that started to climb aboard the life craft. They had knives, one of them had hand grenades. So then he passed the word to go all we could and get back to the ship, which we did. We machine gun them. It would be senseless to let them live and fight another day. The sharks took care of quite a few of them. You mentioned in this forum that you filled out about one of the most inspiring things you saw was one of the shipmates carry a, a powder bag. Yeah. Throw it over. Could you talk about that, please? Our main battery was 14 inch gun in the turret. And the crew in the turret, uh, well, let me go back with, they actually lived in that turret. They had uh, three fours. Three decks below them where the sleeping quarters were, ammo, projectiles. When they load the gun, they dram the, what we call a bullet, the projectile up in the board, and then they, depending on how far away they wanted to shoot it, they would put bags of gunpowder, and the last bag in was a primer, it was a small black bag, contained fulminate of mercury. It was attached to the wires, and um, on a couple of occasions, the fulminating of mercury didn't ignite, didn't explode. So they would ask for a volunteer to take it out of the gun, take it down through a patch in the bottom of the turret to the deck, take it over to the lifeline on the side and throw it over. They would clear everybody out of the turret, but the one man, he would, they blew up the klaxon horn, which you couldn't hear. They would 
he opened the hatch, got everything ready, and he opened the gun, got that bag, and took off down the ladder in the back of the turret and threw it over the side. In return, he got a medal. <laughs> and of course, in his record, he was never to be asked to volunteer for anything. Again. <laughs> I never saw one explode in a man's hand. In Japan, after the surrender, uh, my destroyer stayed there and we were given shore duty. And, uh, shore patrol carried a gun and walked at beat. And after about a month of that, we went into the Sea of Japan, I think you call it. Anyways, it was sown with the floating mines that our B-29s had dropped to, uh, to get the Japanese ship. Mm -hmm. Our job was to find those mines and explode them. So then uh, about 10 destroyers all lined up. And when we found a mine, we stayed there until we either exploded or they sunk them. That was kind of hazardous. It was quite a job on the seas were off to hit a floating mine. The captain would get mad because the rest of the fleet had gone on without us. He would back the ship up close as he dared to the mine and then we'd shoot at it with a rifle. My bunk was attached to the hull I could, you know, when things were quiet, I could lay in my bunk and hear the water gurgle on the other side of the hall, probably half inch steel. One night, this was a you know, god awful screech and cling and noise up in front of the ship. And we lay there and we listened, and I got louder and louder and louder. And it was a floating mine that didn't explode. Mm -hmm. It ran the whole length of the ship. Within, oh, I'd say four, two feet of my head. <laughs> By the time it got back that far, we knew what it was. Everybody held their breath. The skipper shut the screws down so the cable wouldn't get caught in the propeller. Um, awful lucky. Now, when you were ashore, did you ever have any? Uh, encounters with the Japanese people at all, or? Yeah. Uh, at first they were afraid of us. The, the women, the men were sullen. And, you know, just, we would be, we surrendered. But as time went by, they got friendly and we bartered cigarettes for souvenirs. One of my beats at one time was around the Imperial Palace, one side of the... That's quite a sight. Tokyo was just almost ashes. Their houses were made out of bamboo and paper. Mm -hmm. We had firebombed them so much that it was really not much luck. When did you go home? I got that appointment to the academy. I went home. Uh, I was in the academy about two weeks. Then I went home for 30 days. And uh, came back and was assigned to the destroyer. Mm -hmm. I was discharged on uh, May 20th of 47. Where were you discharged? Lido Beach. Mm -hmm. Now how did you get back across the country then you took a train? Yeah, from New York up to Syracuse. Mm -hmm. How were you greeted when you got home? I surprised them. I, uh, of course my mother and father didn't have a phone those days. They couldn't mm -hmm. get one. We lived on a small farm. I just died from Syracuse to home. <laughs> I'm walking around my shoe bag. They knew I was 
beat this dirt, but they had no idea why I was going to get home. Did you ever use the GI Bill? Yeah. Yeah, I went to uh, gun school on the GI Bill. Yeah. And you said that's the kind of work you did, the, yeah. and you still do. Right. Did you uh, ever use that 5220 club? Yeah, all of them. <laughs> Do you join any veterans organizations at all? Yes, I'm a life member of the VFW and the American Police. Are you active or have you been active in them? No, no. I was maybe 20 years ago, but lately I haven't been. I can't stand very long. Now your hearing was affected by your time in the service? Yeah. When I was discharged, I had a hearing loss. Now, do you, did you ever uh, stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? Yeah, a friend of mine named Charles Barrett from Watertown. He and I went into boot camp together. We went to guns. Gunners made school together. We copied each other's uh, exam papers, figuring that if we both had the same graduate mark, we'd be assigned the same space. But that didn't work. He was assigned to the amphibious force in Virginia, and I was assigned to a battleship on the West Coast. He was in the invasion of Saipan. In a, LCT, which was sunk, so they put him on shore duty there on Saipan. Uh, every time we got in there and stayed overnight, I'd go ashore and spend the night with him. Uh, later he was assigned to Tinian, which is just a little ways from Saipan. And he worked on the pit where they loaded the A-bomb. He didn't know at the time what it was for. He knew the pit was so they could drive the plane over and mm -hmm. something up. But he didn't know it was a atomic bomb until after they dropped it. And there he'd been working. Mm -hmm. He's out in the thick fall now. He's retired from uh, St. Regis Paper Company. Did you ever go to any reunions? No. The battleship reunions were all on the west coast. And the destroyer, uh, those guys are all Vietnam, Korea. I don't think there's two or three of us World War II veterans left mm -hmm. on that ship. How do you think your time in the service had an effect or changed your life? Well, it's hard to say. I don't know what I would have done had I not went to the Navy. It's just something I always knew I was going to do, even before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. But after the war was killed, I was determined. I had no idea that the war would last that long. I thought that little snotty country that took on a Martian. <laughs> but they were tough. I probably would have went to college if my father wanted to. Mm -hmm. So, engineering. But you didn't use the GI Bill to go to college, though? No, I used it. But I like working on guns. You know. mm -hmm. Now, if you hold this up in, in front of you and tell us where and when that was taken. Uh, this was taken in Syracuse, 1945, when I was home on Are there any other okay. stories or remembrances you think you wanted to add? or? Well, I remember in the invasion of Saipan, 
our building was bombarding. Uh, we had a full team that our, was our spotter. And we would cruise the length of the island and shoot at targets that he had found, and then we would <coughs> turn around and come back, and the other side of the ship would shoot. Well, the first time cleaned up, but I remember seeing the people jump off the suicide cliff. The women would throw their babies over, and then they would jump after them through the. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, when we had the offside when we weren't shooting. We had time to go over, and with binoculars we could watch some of the action on the island. I remember a marine, the shoreline on Saipan, and the jungle came right to the water. In most places, this marine had come out on a little beach, and the two Japanese soldiers, he was on his knees, obviously pleading for his life. And they were torturing him with their brain nuts. Finally, they killed him. We could turn, we killed them. One of our five inch guns. The suicide plane that hit us was on Tech Oldman Airfield. And was on. We could see the plane, and we could see the runway, but the runway was on the same level as we were, so we couldn't tell if our shells were going over the runway or short. Mm -hmm. We were trying to blow holes on it so he couldn't take off. But he did take off and he went away from us up over the mountain. And we turned our attention to other things and he swung up into the sun and, and uh, dove on us from there. Another thing that I remember vividly, underneath our 40 millimeter gun mount was the magazine, which is all room about 20 foot square, and the 40 millimeter ammunition was stored in square can, sealed. There were two men down there that took the ammo out of those cans and passed it up through a hole in the ceiling to them. Uh, Go up above. When that ammo was packed, it was packed in ether. They put the ammo in and then they pumped the air out, pumped the ether in mm -hmm. to preserve the. Well, in the heat of battle, these two fellows had to take those covers off those cans. And the room was filled with ether. They had a big fan that sucked the ether out, but the hatch on the other end of the room was closed during the battle. After the battle was over and we were cleaning up, we found that we had been hit by one of our own uh, ships, guns, one of the ships in the fleet. We theorized he was shooting at a Japanese plane going away from him. Mm -hmm. This five inch shell had penetrated the full length of that magazine room through all those cans of ammo filled with ether and never exploded. Wow. It was an American made. Found it almost on the other side of the ship. It was uh, galleys, quartermen. Those two fellows in that magazine didn't know it. Everything was. But that would have blown half the ship right away. So then they made a rule. We were allowed to shoot at a plane coming towards us, but not one going away mm -hmm. when we were in formation.
after uh, we went to Saipan, Tinan, and then Guam. And we were uh, sent to Australia on R&R, &R, but we never made it there. We were rammed by our sister ship to Tennessee during the night. Her radar went to put. So we spent our R&R in &R the dry dock in New Liberty being repaired. It was four o'clock in the morning and caught the crew in their bunks and uh, flooded the compartment. We had to dig them out. Both Matt Day and I in the Tennessee and the California were never allowed liberty in the same port at the same time. <laughs> now it seems childish, but at that time, Well, thank you very much for welcoming you another. I just want to say I wish I'd stayed in the Navy and retired. Mm -hmm. I did. Do you regret that taking the Naval Academy appointment too? Yes, I do, but it was just impossible. Mm -hmm. The day that I joined the class, they were studying calculus. I didn't have calculus in high school. Mm -hmm. I had been home for almost two years. And I had the, the bottom 20% of the people in that class were failed, were fun. Mm -hmm. The other 80% went on to the academy. This was a William and Mary College prep school up there. So I knew the minute that uh, I found out I was in a copies class. Uh, the term started in the fall. Well, I went to the commanding officer and asked him if there was any way I could stay and start with the next class. And he said, no, there'd be two more men. They took two men from the Pacific and two from the Atlantic fleets. Then they had all the congressional appointees. <coughs> Okay, well thank you very much for coming for your interview.